every one of us has mess in our lives. Over a lifetime, that mess can accumulate and grow. It can weigh on us and drag us down. We need rest. We need strength. We are a mess. Can you confess that right now? I'm a mess. Please say that. If you didn't say that, if you don't believe it, if you don't feel that in your heart, you're in the wrong church. You need to be in the church of self-righteous people who other people are the problem. Because you see, throughout, throughout Christian history, throughout the 2,000 years, I'm getting to the scripture, guys. I'll be building to the scripture today. Sorry, didn't tell you. Scripture's coming. I'm building to the scripture. Throughout Christian history, Jesus' teachings have been taught in a way to distort them and tear them up. Really, the issue is, why are we a mess? Why are we a mess? And throughout history... People have perverted the teachings of Jesus Christ to say, because of other people, that's why. They, they are the problem. For the first two or three hundred years, a group of writing called the Antonician Patristics just really developed the scriptures we have today, the what to keep and what really aligned with Jesus Christ's teachings to hold the Old and New Testaments together, to put that together in powerful ways. Then we entered the Dark Ages when the Christian faith was used to subjugate and use other people. See, this concept emerged, this misuse of Christianity that said, whatever Christians discover, I mean, Christopher Columbus was under this, at 1500, 1492 to be exact. But whatever Christians discover is theirs and they get to own it, including people because they're heathen, they're pagan. They're not loved by God. And they're the problem. In this new land, they're the problem. We have to settle it, Native Americans in our way, but it's okay, we can push them out. Why? They're pagans, God doesn't love them. Calvin came along in the 1500s. You can look it up, the tulip formula that tried to address this. But we just really wanted Christians to be on top. We wanted Christians to subjugate and rule everybody else and for everybody else to be the problem. Humans can mess up even the teachings of Jesus Christ. We messed up the Garden of Eden. If you can mess up the Garden of Eden, you can mess up anything. I remember when we remodeled our kitchen, first thing I did was mess it up. Sharon walked in. You get it, don't you? So a group of people called the Remonstrants comes along and say, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You're teaching... John Calvin came to help us get out of the subjugating others and other people are bad. This God loves some and doesn't love others mentality, the remonstrance group said, led by Jacobus Arminius, if you want to look that up. I have a lot of stuff you can look up in my sermons. It'd be fun. If you were a geek or a nerd, I tell you, my sermons are a goldmine of stuff I'm not saying. But you could look it up. Jacobus Arminius. So, or just say remonstrance. So, Jacobus Arminius comes along and says, no, no, no. God loves everybody. Everybody is cherished. They aren't the problem. You're the problem. Because God's prevenient and amazing grace, you can reject. You can say no to God. They aren't the problem you're the problem. John Wesley came along in the 1700s and he, he just 
puts this on steroids with God loves everyone. He put it on his plaque. He put it on the Methodist church's seal, even when the Methodist church was just a movement. God is love. And that love is for every soul. Other people aren't the problem. Confess that you are the problem and deal with it. The 1800s comes along. Sadly, in the 1800s, we continue what John Wesley was fighting in the 1700s. See, people who could afford wigs and powder on their face and to look really cool, they could come to church, but coal miners and stuff like that, ah, uh, no. Why? Misusing John Calvin, they go, because God doesn't love them or they wouldn't be coal miners. God loves me because I'm rich. God loves me, you can tell I'm in a powdered wig. Isn't that awful to think our faith gets used like that? But friends, we're in a history where it's used like that all the time. So we come to the 1800s. And as we walk through the 1800s, this country in the 1700s says, all men are created equal. They didn't mean women yet. They didn't mean people who didn't own property yet. They didn't mean black people yet, but it was a huge step. In the 1800s, we fought this whole next step. Because you're black doesn't mean you can be enslaved. There was a doctrine taught in churches that black people were subhuman and therefore could be enslaved because, once again, this misuse of the gospel, God loves some people and not other people, so God doesn't love them. God loves us, and so we can enslave them because of two things. One, this prevenient grace was kind of substituted with this thing called um, predestination that said, some people are just predestined for heaven. Doesn't matter what they do, they can do whatever they want to do, you know, because, so you can abuse slaves, and you know why you can abuse slaves? Because they're not really loved by God. So we fight this battle. We fight this battle to say everyone is valuable. God loves everyone. They aren't the problem. We are the problem. As the Civil War is finishing up, and we're wondering what it meant and how do we interpret it. Two songwriters come together and they take a Civil War song. Bum, 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 ba, bum, ba, bum, bum. And they put words to it. Now, these are 1800s words, and they're inappropriate for today because we don't call Native Americans red people, and we don't call Asians yellow people. But please hear it in the 1800s language in which it was written. Why was the Civil War fought? Because Jesus loves the little children. Do you hear that marching song? All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are what? They are, they are subjugated because we are God's beloved and they're not, no. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. My friends, that led into the 1900s when it wasn't just slavery. We tried to take this reclaiming of Jesus' gospel to not just black people, but women. Any group that could be oppressed, and you could say, well, God didn't give them equal God didn't want them to be equal. God wants us to rule them. And in the 1900s, half of America, not quite half, thank God, were ready to support Hitler in the Nazi movement as he said there is a master race that God loves. And just so you know, we're it. You know, anytime somebody comes up with who is superior, it's amazing how they're always in that category. And Hitler says, Jews are the problem, black people are the problem. God doesn't love them, God loves us. And he put that on every dagger and weapon. And in German, it's called Gott mit uns. And it means God is with me. 
not you. And so in the 1900s, we we just kept saying no, no. And we fought another war over this, not misunderstanding, intentional misinterpretation of the teachings of Jesus Christ. And so in the 1900s, we included a lot of other people with Jews and black people. We included every kind of person. And in the 1900s, we ended up wanting to say all means all. Jesus loves the little children. I'm going to push you back a little bit. Be they Muslim, be they Jewish, be they Buddhist, be they Hindu, be they person who wasn't raised with a religion at all. Jesus loves them. John Wesley taught that as what's called prevenient grace. Now we are in the 2000s. My friends, we're not done fighting this battle yet. We're not done. Because, don't mean to get political. Please don't hear me as political. Hear me as a preacher preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nazi flags are flown in public in my nation. We're not done with this God loves me so God doesn't love you. So I told you to get to the scripture. That was my preamble. So if that's not the problem, yeah, I'm not preaching yet. Just think about that. I got my wingtips on, got my tie on. Hold your seat. Those of you at home, don't take a big gulp of coffee. You're going to spit it out. Then what is the issue? Let's show some scripture. If it's not other people, what is it? Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? For the very good I want to do, I cannot do, and the very bad I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Who is the problem? See, y'all, as long as we can say they are, we don't have to sweat it. And as long as we can say, I'm going to heaven no matter what, because God loves me. God doesn't love them. And they are the problem with this world. As long as you can put it off, you don't have to actually do Christianity. Because Christianity... Christianity comes to a confession of sin. Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, wretched woman that I am. Who will deliver me? This scripture ends up with thanks be to God who has given us the victory in Jesus Christ. So John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, takes this scripture takes the prevenient grace of before the Catholic Church was ever called the Catholic Church, recovered by Jacobus Arminius, recovered by the Remonstrants, pushed against all these people who say they are the problem. And he starts a Wesleyan movement that says, I am the problem. And I'm going to get with other people, talk with other people about my stuff. We are covered, y'all. But what are we covering? Here's what John Wesley says. There is prevenient grace. Call this a light. Like a candle, like a lamp, like a flashlight. There is prevenient grace in you, empowering grace, enabling grace. These are no other names for it. That give you the power to throw off this icky covering of sin that that comes from our are, are blaming other people, are wanting stuff, are not being in control. Oh, I could just go on about sin forever, but I want to go about the solution, not the problem. My friends, you are covered with icky. But what is it covering? It's covering this light of Christ, this prevenient grace, this soul that shines on the inside of you. Imago Dei, look that up, it's Latin. Imago Dei, we are born in the image of God. What do we do with that? The serpent says to Eve, hey, eat this apple. Eve says, "Uh, God said, don't eat that apple. The serpent says, don't listen to God. Eat the apple. Takes the apple to Adam. They eat the apple. Say, Adam, 
Look at this. Eat the apple. God comes up to them and goes, Adam, I told you not to eat the apple. You ate the apple. What did he say? What did he say? What did he say? All right, at this point, we have two kinds of Christianity. The I confess and the they did it forms. Ready? So let's go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, second story in the Bible. The first one's the seven days. This is the second story. Adam, you ate the dead gum apple. We walk in the evening we walk in the morning too. We hang out. We're friends. I told you not to eat the apple. Adam has the choice of all of humanity in this moment. And what does Adam say? That woman you gave me, she gave me that apple. You can just see God. <sighs> okay. My creation, my beloved, my highest and best in the whole world. Goes to Eve, okay. Eve is second generation technology. By the way, men, please understand that. You were the kind of beta test of what humans would be. When God saw us, God said, eh. So God pulls out a rib, makes human 2.0, and that's women. We know this. They can tolerate pain better. They're more intelligent. They have a more adaptive brain. They have a more sensitive brain. They can see like 420 unbelievable colors, and I can see eight. I worked for three years trying to define the different pinks that are there and still can't tell salmon from Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> what does Eve say? And when she said the serpent told me to do it, y'all, you and I have been doing that ever since. So who will deliver us from this body of death? Prevenient grace, y'all. Inside your soul is the living, powerful flame of the Holy Spirit. And out here is the God of creation, the Imago Dei. And what we've got to do is let our inner light and that outer light burn off this icky covering. Michelangelo painted the, uh, the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel. It got all icky, it got all covered. You couldn't see color, you couldn't see it. There's this huge debate over restoring it. They restored it in the colors and the, the beauty was so amazing. My friends, Lent is about you restoring the light of your imago dei, the beautiful creature you were created to be. It's been, it's been covered with the icky of blaming other people. It's been covered with the icky of sin. It's been covered with the icky of, well, I don't know. You know what covers you. I can't confess what your icky is, but you can. And my friends, you have an inner light that'll burn that off. It is the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Living inside of you. But you gotta move from this form of Christianity that says other people are the problem. And once you confess I am the problem, you turn to the Holy Spirit inside you and the living Christ outside you and the light inside you and the light outside you can burn off this dross. See, inside here, I am built like a Greek god. A bronze statue, six-pack, huge shoulders, long, curly, full hair, and an amazing, strong, chiseled chin inside here. But I have covered it with a patina over the bronze. Do you get me? My bronze has a patina. So does yours. Lent has been going for four days. It's a 40-day time to recover the light of your soul, the provenient grace inside your very being. To not blame others, but to recover, restore the image of God that lives within you. 
And as I said with Casey at the beginning, it wasn't a joke. You've burned four days. If it hadn't gone on to Lent, yeah, this is the time to be restored. You don't need a self-help book. You don't need other people. Other people aren't the problem. You already have everything you need in the Holy Spirit indwelling in your soul, enabling, empowering a grace you only need to claim. A grace you only need to claim. So I started this sermon with a children's song. I'm gonna end this sermon with a children's song. And you have a decision to make. Every good sermon either causes you to make a decision or gives you good news. Well, this is a twofer. This is a BOGO. The good news is you have everything you need burning inside your soul like a bright candle flame ready for the lens to be cleaned off for it to shine. But the decision is, do you want to clean off your grubby grime and let that light so shine? And I have a song for you. This little light of mine I'm going to let it sh- Not supposed to sing. Silent. This is a little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Can you sing that this 40 days? Put it under a bushel, or the grime and slime I've put on it, or the stuff I've blamed others about, or the sorrow, woe is me, poor baby I've put on myself, or the any other grime and slime that covers my flame. No. I'm going to let it shine. Hold it as a mantra. Hold it as a power because inside you is the power to overcome what's making you sad, what's making you mad, what's making you ashamed. Prevenient. Before you ever decide, that's what that means. God has already put it in you. Grace. Did your grandma say to you, there but for the grace of God? Well, that's what she's talking about. That grace can shine. I think we have a closing hymn. Do we have a closing hymn, Jeremy? What is our closing hymn? Do you know? Amazing grace. grace. Isn't that coincidental? Let's stand and sing. Not even going to worry about taking this. Well, I got to take it off. It's making life. Boom, like that. (laughs) All right, y'all. I am offering a 10% discount on Lent right here, right now. You've had four days already burned off. You've got 36 days to go. But 36 instead of 40. Just get on it. Get with it. Get on the stick. Put a pin in the other people did it. And for the next 36 days, say, I have the power within me to do this. Pick a sin, any sin you want, that's yours, not somebody else's. Fight it down, bite it on the ear, pin it to the ground, defeat it in 36 days, and come out on Easter saying, thanks be to God who has given us the glory, and let Easter shine from this little light of mine.